Welcome to the Faith First Podcast. My name is Pastor Craig Brown. I'm a part of First Lutheran Church in Southeast Cedar Rapids, community of faith where we discover more together. So glad you're along with us here today on this episode. Should be a fun and exciting episode. Today we are talking about my favorite Bible story, which is called The Prodigal Son. Jesus tells an amazing story of God's graciousness towards us all, even when we are face down in pig mud, <laughs> which sometimes we find ourselves from time to time and uh, wonder, is God really uh, still love us? Is God still with us? Um, we've made a mess of things, Lord. Are you still here? And we get that question answered for us today. So uh, not only will Pastor Steve, but Pastor Katie are going to be here. The three of us are going to have an amazing discussion about that. I know uh, it'll be enlightening for you. So stay tuned for that. Also, one of our faithful members, Pat Marshall, will be here to pray with us. And we are so grateful that you are along with us here today, too. We're ready to provide a gracious welcome for you as we begin to put our faith first. That sound effect means it's time for our What's Brewing segment. What's brewing around First Lutheran Church? What's happening? What's coming up? What are we planning? Of course, right now, the big plans are being set in motion for our celebration dinner, which is happening on Sunday, uh, November 17th. And it is for everyone in the church. Of course, it's a culmination of our capital campaign and all those that have uh, helped us get to this incredible uh, point in history. But it is, as Pastor Steve says, it is not a pay for play (laughs) celebration. Everyone, anyone and everyone is invited to this thing. It has been provided for us by a special gift from the congregation. So we want you to go on an RSVP. You can do that on our website at firstlutheranscr.org. We also sent out a snail mail to every member and invitation. You can return that. Uh, We're going to be making some phone calls. Um, So those are being made this week just to catch up with people saying, hey, you had a chance to RSVP so you can uh, by phone. So via that phone call, you could give us your RSVP over the phone, uh, or you can drop it off in worship this coming weekend uh, in that slip of paper or just let us know when you're here. Because we, we, I think it's somewhere up around 114 RSVPs, which uh, could be, uh, I don't know the exact number, but it's over 200 people uh, already. So we want that party to grow. So be a part of that and get those uh, RSVPs in this week. I'm going to try to keep this segment short this week so we can have a longer uh, discussion with Pastor Steve and Pastor Katie. So excited to be talking about one of my favorite scriptures. So let's go ahead and get to that. But that is a quick look at what's brewing at First Lutheran Church. It's time to dig into the Word with Pastor Craig. Pastor Craig, you are bringing the message today. Today we kind of have a special gathering. We've got both Pastor Craig, Pastor Katie, and myself, Pastor Steve, to have conversation over one of the more well-known and maybe surprising parables in the Bible. That is the story of the prodigal son. Yeah, we did this uh, a couple months ago on a different scripture, and I really liked that the three of us were in on it. And yeah. since this is my favorite passage in the Bible, I want to hear your guys' thoughts on it as well. Uh, so that's why I thought maybe a conversation would be would be better. Okay. So more just a kind of a, a general conversation leading into Sunday rather than right. a prelude or kind of a, a glimpse exactly, because you may take this conversation and... Yeah. The Holy Spirit will go do God's Spirit work on you, and we'll see what happens for Sunday. So write my sermon, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh-huh. You know, I have a men's Bible study on Wednesday morning, and sometimes, you know, I've got the sermon, and sometimes I say, okay, guys, help me write it. What are we going to do? Yeah. Um, what do you think we should say today? Yeah, Let's all read yeah. the scriptures together. <laughs> How is God speaking? Yeah. So, a uh, story of the prodigal son, which actually we say that. But that, those are not words that are in the Bible. No, in uh, fact, I think it's a misnomer, the title. Right. I, I, no, I'll start with I love it because I think it's the best characterization of God that we have. It's the okay. most grace-filled characterization I can find. Here's a guy who makes all the wrong choices. He does nothing to please his father, and we could assume the father is, is God in this in scenario. This wayward human being does nothing to make it right himself right with God. 
and his father and does everything wrong. And yet what position does the God position take, the father, not one of scorn or judgment or, you know, I'm waiting for you to get right with me. No, he's standing on a hill you know, looking, constantly searching, hoping, waiting that the son will come home to him. Mm-hmm. And when he does, he, he picks up his robes and runs which in Jesus' story in that time is completely unheard of. No king would ever (laughs) show their legs to run to somebody. They would stand and wait for someone to come to them. So it's just an extremely grace-filled story in my mind about how grace-filled God is. And God accepts us just as we are with all of our faults, and there's nothing we can do to earn it. That's why I've always loved it. Mm-hmm. But um, I know there's more interpretations. In fact, Martha Bonte, our outreach director, gave me a book uh, called Timothy Kel- by Timothy Keller called The Prodigal God. Because what I was just telling her, I love that characterization of God. She says, yeah, it's not really about the son at all. It's right. about God, the gracious God. So she gave me this, and I have some thoughts on that. And I know you guys have some other sources and years of preaching this and your own thoughts. So I want to hear from you guys, too. You know, the... Uh what sets up this parable is a conversation that Jesus is having with the Pharisees. Um, and the Pharisees are complaining to Jesus that uh, he's spending time with the wrong people, uh, with sinners and tax collectors, uh, eating with them, and they take offense. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, the story actually you know, has one more uh, scene, not just simply that uh, the father goes out and runs to the prodigal son, quote unquote, but later on, the older son hears there's a party going and he stands outside and the father has to go outside to the older son and say, will you come in? You know, will you, will you join us? And uh, the older son is kind of uh, miffed uh, at what's happening, doesn't understand it. And it's an open question whether the older son will ever go in or not. I suppose a little bit like those Pharisees, will they, you know, ever enjoy God's grace or not? Exactly. You know, the, the father invites people into a party, and uh, there he even says, you know, my son was dead, but now is alive. I mean, there is a sort of resurrection theme that happens. The Pharisees, you know, they want God's grace to be a little more arduous. Uh, it's got to hurt a little bit. You know, they would like the repentance maybe to be a little more uh, challenging. Uh, they would like the thresholds to be a little more well defined, and yet Jesus is simply enjoying and having fellowship with sinners and tax collectors. Mm-hmm. And it seems like the father is simply taking delight in the son, and wanting the older son to join in as well. Um, yeah, I think it's again Keller says this is in his first chapter. This is not so much a story about God's unconditional love for his wayward son as much it is is to examine how we the elder faithful brothers of the church are willing to welcome others. Mm. And when I read that and I thought, well, that just fits with the theme mm-hmm. <laughs> of, sure. of how, how are we welcoming people in the church? And I know Jesus was talking, there were Pharisees in the crowd, but there were also tax collectors and sinners in the crowd. Mm-hmm. So there's kind of the older brother and the younger brother in the crowd that Jesus is talking to. And he's, he's addressing them both. Yeah. I think, Katie, you had some ideas well, on that. Well, you know, I, I, at a very um, tender time in my own life, I encountered a book called um, from Henry Nouwen uh, called The Prodigal Son. And he has a beautiful painting. I think it's by Rembrandt. And you stare at this painting for, for days as you do this devotional. And he gives you an opportunity to imagine yourself as either one or all of the above characters. Like So you sit with one at a time. And one thing he gave a whole chapter to is the onlookers. And what did the onlookers think and see? Because we give a lot of energy to the father, the son, and the older son. Mm -hmm. What did the onlookers feel? What were they experiencing as truth? Back to your um, analogy that this is the most lovely story of, of God welcoming us home. Interestingly enough, what I heard in that in that very moment when you were speaking, the son knew how to get home, where home was going to be. The son was uncertain whether he would be welcomed. He, I mean, he had screwed around, but God's arms were open. If that's the analogy, where you, I mean, there was no question, you belong here. This is home. Here you are loved. Here we will throw an extravagant party to, to throw your love. Now, I would also say that everyone looking was a sinner, for we all sin. Mm-hmm. It's how do we acknowledge our sin? How are we going to come face to face with what character we find ourselves either 
finding the most likeness with or the part that we go, I don't like that in myself as I'm hearing this story because I would want to be getting the full, my full share. And one thing that is comes through in this chair, uh, the whole story is, when did God not provide for every member in this story? When did God not provide for the elder son? He just doesn't want the younger son to get anything anymore. It's about not having, not being, um, not, not being equal, yet God said, you are all welcome to my house. The father wants both sons in the party in his home. Um, they have to make a decision on, on whether or not they will go in. And that's kind of the cliffhanger. Somebody remembered or talked about a Christmas Carol by uh, Dickens, and which is based a little bit on uh, this story. But there at the end, Scrooge comes around mm -hmm. and uh, you know is now sort of the benefactor of the, uh, of his neighborhood of a community. You know, there in a way there is a sort of Aesop fable character to the Car Christmas Carol. You know, there's a moral kind of tale to it. The thing about the parables is that they function differently. I always think of them as like the ink black teachable, test, teachable moments, you know. Mm -hmm. it, and Rorschach, it, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know, when you look at it, what do you see? Mm -hmm. and, and it has a way of by what you say revealing something about who you are. I think how we interact with the story ultimately, its power is is that it points a light back on our lives, as you mm -hmm. were saying, you know, from Henry Nowen. Uh, in his book, you know, looking at the v various characters, the power of the story is to say, okay, not simply what's the moral of the tale, but who am I? Mm -hmm. And how do I receive or understand the nature of God's grace? And we all find ourselves, I think, every, every character in the story is in some ways outside mm -hmm. the father's love. They have to be welcomed back in by the father. I mean, the younger son who runs away, the older son who's standing out. But even, as you say, the onlookers, it's the father who directs the onlookers to say, you know, get the calf, set mm -hmm. the table, yeah. throw the party, mm -hmm. let's gather. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's the father it is God who is the one who is taking the action, mm -hmm. the one who is creating the conditions of my son was dead and now is alive, a resurrection moment. And, and the abundance, and, the abundance of this event. Yes. And everybody's trying to catch up with it. Mm -hmm. I, I, one of the questions I had in the, in the Bible study is, did you imagine this party to be a comfortable, easy party or one of those uncomfortable parties? Mm. Is everybody uh, I, was, I, I always kind of thought, you know, everybody was having a happy, joyful time. But really, it's a strange party. Yeah. And, and uh, the father, he's all in it. And everyone else is having to catch up. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's a way in which we're always having to yeah, catch yeah, up yeah. to the grace of God. There's always something about the nature of God's grace that makes us uncomfortable because maybe we didn't do enough. Or, as I'll say, you know, thank you, God, for giving me. Now, I'm not so sure about the next yes. person. Yep. Yeah. Um, it, you know, so that is the way in which God's grace uh, catches us all, mm -hmm. both by surprise and invites us to go to a place uh, that's unexpected, and if we can f ultimately end, you know, enter into it, to, you know, to have our own death and resurrection mm -hmm. experience into the joy of God. I think there's a lot of uncomfortability throughout the throughout the parable when you really yes. take it apart. I mean, right from the beginning, Keller says it really is a tale of, of two lost sons. There's the lost younger son, but then there's the lost elder son. Right. They're both lost. Right. They don't know what they have. Exactly. Right. And, and so he says um, in his book, uh, the original listeners were not melted into tears by this story, but rather were thunderstruck, offended, and infuriated. Jesus' purpose is not to warm our hearts, but to shatter our categories. Yeah. Well, so the old <laughs> that's a part of a par parable, right? A teachable moment. Mm -hmm. We have to learn something if we already knew it. Jesus wouldn't have had to have shared it one more time. Now listen to this story. Well, and isn't it something? We've been at this parable for 2,000 years, and it still has the power to surprise. Yeah. yeah. Oh, did this morning, yeah. So you think about the older son and his experience. So the younger son uncharacteristically demands his inheritance before his father dies, which in that time, you're saying you're dead to me. Mm -hmm. So the older son has to watch his younger brother Tell, tell him that his father is dead mm -hmm. and then demand his inheritance, which would have been a third. So the older brother uh, would have gotten an extra portion. 
So he would have gotten two thirds. When his father would die, he'd get two thirds of his estate and the younger brother would get one third. So he gave him a third. So now the entire estate has been shrunk down to two thirds. So when he comes back, the younger son comes back, uh, the younger brother, the older brother is, and he's talking about killing the fattened calf. And he was, wait a minute, this guy's, <laughs> we're already down in our, in what I'm going to get. Now I'm going to get, he's coming back and he's back. And so I'm getting two thirds of two thirds. Mm hmm. You know, and I've been here and I've worked hard. So he's watching his hard earned money uh, just go out the door to welcome this kid who he thinks isn't worth the money. And so that to me, when we look at our church, we worked hard for our money and uh, we're going to give it to some people that may not even love Jesus that are coming through our doors. We're going to, mm-hmm. we're going to rent it, pay, spend $3 million to renovate our sanctuary or our narthex and, and our children's areas for people that may not appreciate God as much as we do. Come on now. And then we say that as being Christ, because in this abundance, in this abundance, no one was turned away. The, the line, um, he was dead to me is the son saying it to the father, not the father to the son. The father was never lost. He was. He had oh, cared for his people. He had this abundance because he hadn't. He was still giving um, to his people. His son has enough and still wants someone to pay a price of, of being th- thrown out or cast out instead of welcomed in. We struggle with enough. Here is the church often too saying, "Heaven, um, we we will preach. Heaven's supposed to be crowded, but we do look around and go." But you're not going to get in, right? <laughs> and then if you're not going to get in, someone might be looking at me and saying, I'm not going to get in. Yeah. And praise the Lord that the Father says, wow, my heaven is crowded. All are welcomed. I think back to this party that's awkward in this party. One thing that happens is that the Father gives the lead. The Father says, this is my reaction. This is how I will love. This is how I forgive is not waiting for the group to have a consensus. Yes. And I think that's the difference, or how do I want to say, within our own tradition, we understand that it is God's action that has the first and last word, and we're catching up. We don't think of faith or religion as sort of lining up our attitudes and behaviors so that we somehow are worthy or we've done it right to get in. And that really is sort of, in the um, setting for the parable, it's kind of a story within the story because, you know, the setting of uh, Luke 15 is Jesus is having a conversation with the Pharisees who said, okay, we've kind of got this figured out. And Jesus, you're eating with the wrong people. You're enjoying, you know, this is not right because these people have not done the things that they need to do in order to be uh, worthy of God. And it's as if Jesus in telling that parable is saying, well, you you guys are sounding an awful like the older brother. You have all the mercy and grace of God, but it's you're not enjoying it very well. And beyond that, you're not even your heart is isn't even opened up in a way that you can receive, you know, someone else. So that the story of of God's wel- welcome is God is the one who takes the initiative, and we're the ones who receive and catch up. I you know I think about the great celebrations in the church are not about what I did, but about what God does. Mm. Christmas, you know, none of us make Christmas happen. God comes to us uh, in the birth of Christ. Easter, is that, I mean, we can put flowers out and do it, but we're just catching up to what God has done. We're not throwing the party. God ha- is the party, and we are coming and gathering. Yes, and uh, it makes it happen. In, in a way, in this story, as you said, uh, the Father is the one that's making it happen. Mm. It, it could even be that Jesus isn't trying to make a statement ab- about the, the people in the present that are being excluded, but he could be telling his f- future followers a bit about what the future is going to hold for them. And that you think of the early Christians, they were looked at by the Romans uh, and by the Jewish people. The Romans looked at them as pagans, saying, mm. well, where was your temple? And the early Christians said, well, we don't have a temple. They said, well, who's your high priest that you go to? And they said, we don't have a high priest. They said, okay, what sacrifices do you make? And they say, well, we don't need to make any sacrifices. Jesus is our sacrifice. So this would have been so far outside of the realm that it, they would be complete outsiders. And if we look at our churches today and we tend to draw 
this is these are Keller's words. We tend to draw conservative, button-down, moralistic people, people who feel like you know uh, we want to do the right thing in the world, which is a good good thing. But Keller says the licentious and the liberated, or the broken or marginalized, now avoid the church. And that if that's the truth for us, friends, that can only mean one thing: that the preaching of our ministers and the practice of our parishioners do not have the same effect that Jesus had, then we must not be declaring the same message that Jesus did. If our churches aren't appealing to our young, quote unquote, younger brothers, they must be full of elder brothers, more people more like the elder brothers than we'd like to think. So it really is a conviction upon our hearts as much as is the Pharisees to say, are you being like Christ? Are, are you being a completely different faith movement or are you right back to where the, the, the Jewish church leaders were, that it's all about th- this church and it's all about our institution and it's all about us? That is something about reading the Bible is we always want to make it about another time, another place, another people, someone else. And uh, what does it mean to read ourselves into the story? And um, I think no one has ever done reading a parable until you are uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And when you get to the point of being uncomfortable – then finally God is getting at you. Which would make sense why if you're, we read the parable and we're uncomfortable, it's a teachable moment, the Pharisees would have heard the parable and been angry because there is, there is um, finger pointing, but there's also conviction. Often in conviction, we have two opportunities. We can learn from our conviction and say, you know, I just got convicted. I, I can change my heart. I can be transformed or I can be convicted, draw the line in the sand and kick you out and be angry. Mm-hmm. Um, there will be a reaction, though, and they react because the story goes on and on to get more parables where there'll be more convictions and more um, uncomfortability. I appreciate this parable right now, just the opportunity to sit in something familiar when uh, globally um, we are a world right now dealing with a lot of uncertainty how do we see that God has been faithful time and time again? Mm-hmm. God has provided for us time and time again. We wake up each morning breathing in the air that we did not create, but is abundantly given. We take the next breath, and it is there, and we trust the breath after that will to be there. That is our hope, a God who is steadfast with us, open arms saying, come home. You are welcomed here. So the, the story of the lost younger brother, I think we get that. He made some bad choices, <laughs> right? So he's lost. The story of the lost elder brother is that he's putting his hope in his choices, hmm. that he made good choices, so he should be accepted. He deserves this. He deserves he, I should he, be accepted based hmm. upon my choices. But he's also lost because he dishonors his father. The first one dishonors his father by saying, you're dead to me. Give me my money. I'm gone. The second one dishonors the father when the father decides to, to kill the fattened calf, which they only would have done for high celebrations. They hardly ever eat, ate meat, and they certainly weren't going to eat the, the, the biggest, fattest calf. That was only special celebrations. So he's saying, the father's saying, this is a special celebration. The whole town would have been invited. As you said, Pastor Steve, it would have been very awkward. Everyone's sitting there. Why are we doing this fatted calf celebration for this kid who has you know, dishonored you? And then, and then the older brother makes his fatal flaw and that he does not come inside. And that completely dishonors the father because this is now the father's deem us a whole town celebration and you're not there. And so he has, to, he has to get up and go outside, which also would have been disgraceful for a king to get up and go outside and, and, and have this conversation with him. Listen, you're dishonoring me by not going in there. And you should go in there because I've always loved you. And that's where the story ends. As you guys said, both said, it's a cliffhanger on purpose because not only to, to, to show the Pharisees' heart, but our hearts. Where, yeah, but, where are we? We're going to end the story as the elder brother. What are we, how are we going to end it? You know, it, for the elder brother, it's not just simply the question about whether he'll go into the party. But all along, you know, the father said, but whatever is mine is yours. Um, yeah. You could have enjoyed my blessings and gifts and being in the part of, and the older brother never enjoyed uh, being the older son. No, he had a bad attitude. Uh, uh, he was wealthy and he had a bad attitude. But, but <laughs> it, more than the bad attitude, he couldn't even en- enjoy what he had. Uh, he wouldn't even live with a sense of thankfulness, no. uh, generosity. And he's still the heir, so he's still the elder. He'll still get the blessing. He will still get the father's um, uh, acknowledgement, and that's not enough. 
So the choice for us, I think, in the cliffhanger is, are we going to be uh, bitter and resentful and, and not participate and welcome people like our younger brothers that are stupid and make bad choices? <laughs> or are we going to be more like the gracious father and end the story with a, a, a more gracious welcome and, and extravagantly spend money and extravagantly spend our time and resources to, to bring in people that we may not see as worthy in the kingdom? Because God sees them as worthy. I think in the cliffhanger, one thing I'd invite us to do is to be, be okay having all the feels. And when we allow all the feels, um, we don't have to exclude the right answer or the wrong answer. It's all the feels, feels, feelings happen at some point in time. I wish I was not as human as I am because there's times I just want righteousness. Yeah, you said off air, Patrick Kay, we all spend time in all positions, right? We have. Well, and that's uh, the idea too is um, which position – well, may be your biggest conviction today may be different than when you heard the story in a different season of your life or you felt that you needed to be the younger son or did you want your your due um, fair price kind of thing. Um, but I'm just – I think um, the it's how did we hear the story sometimes or encounter it today um, gives us pause to reread the story time and time again and get convicted and sit in the, all the feelings – just because how we would read a story at a different points in our life, we may identify with different characters. Mm -hmm. um, we might identify with different experiences. Yeah, one of the questions I had is, what helps you experience faith like a party? Or is that a nonsense question? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, because, I, 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 you know, for the older son, um, faith or his relationship within the family was a matter of hard work. It was about diligence, doing right, being right. And, and waiting. And here he's, you know, offered uh, the party of grace. And it's like, I'm not sure if I, I can, part I can't even identify with it. I can't even en enter into it. For, for me, the party is worship. And I, what's helped me experience my faith as a party is our echo worship on Wednesday and our, our new 11 o'clock, the way we've kind of revamped it. And now I go back and I look at 9 o'clock on traditional and I see it with new eyes and appreciate that as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many times in staff have we come in on Tuesday morning and said, wow, Marita, you just wowed us with that, that music choice or wow, Joel, that I had goosebumps when you, know, you or somebody else was singing this. That's where I think the party is for me. The party for me is when a little eight-year-old has the confidence to go to the Ambo and sit not on one step, but have to have two stools to get up <laughs> high enough. And the room welcomes his words. And every time he says some little word with his little accent, we all smile because we are enjoying hearing another generation proclaim yes. Christ and share the words of God. I, I look at that and all the elders in the room, all the elders of the room have made way in the best way possible for him to, to read the scriptures, to be part of service. Mm -hmm. The judgment now is not there. It is a welcome. It is, yes. of course, an eight-year-old will read scripture. Of course, of course he needs two stools to stand up and reach <laughs> the mic. Of course, this is God's house. Last word, Pesci, what's the party for you in your faith? What's the party? Worship is the party, but I, I'm, I'm going to go, I experience... God's word of grace as a death and resurrection experience. Um, I experience uh, God's word of grace as a word that catch, catches me in those moments of being caught, sets me free. Uh, it, it is a word in which I realize I can't throw the party, but God throws the party for me. I'm not the one that can sort of get my way out, but God is the one that brings me out. For me, that party is all about the surprise of God's power to bring new life where I'm caught. You know, C.S. Lewis uh, wrote a book once called Surpri Surprised by Joy, which is actually when uh, late in life he was confirmed bachelor and he met a girl named Joy and fell in love and got married. Um, she then died of cancer. But the point for him was he was surprised because he didn't think joy was possible anymore. And I asked the question, you know, how does God surprise you by joy? I think of the gospel as being surprised uh, by the joy of God. It all comes back to God's grace. Yep.
We, we ended where we started. <laughs> yes. Well, that is digging into the Word. We've had a conversation uh, with Pastor Craig, Pastor Katie, and myself uh, looking at the prodigal son, and we look forward to how you put it all together for Saturday and Sunday. Thank you, Pastor Craig. Thank you. And thank you, Pastor Katie. Thank you. It's been wonderful. Hi there. My name is Pat Marshall, a member of First Lutheran Church, and I'm honored to be here to pray with you and for you this week. Let us pray. Renew your church, O God. Make us servants to one another for the sake of the gospel. Instill a heart for service and a passion for justice in our bishops, deacons, pastors, and lay leaders. Renew your creation, O God. Sustain the earth and the seas and all that is in them. Kindle in us a reverent awe for all creatures, great and small and strengthen us in our pursuit of climate justice. Renew the nations, O God. Heal our nation's veterans from the unseen wounds of war. Tend to their trauma and soothe burdened consciences. Guide leaders of the world to to end all conflicts and pursue peace. Renew your people, O God. Protect those in our communities who are vulnerable or sick. Accompany persons who are unemployed or underemployed, children who are in foster care, and those who live alone. Watch over and uphold them. Renew this congregation, O God. Guide us as we discern our support for our fall campaign, renewing for God's mission. Thank you that we can trust you so much to meet our needs, that we can thank you even as we pray for our needs. Give us clarity in our mission and boldness in our witness. Happy are those who help was in you. We give thanks for all your faithful ones who praised you as their God all their life long. As we eagerly wait for you, inspire us by their lives of service. We offer our prayers to you, gracious God, trusting in your boundless love for all that you have made. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Thank you, Pat, for those prayers, and thank you to Pastor Katie and Pastor Steve for stopping by and having a great full discussion. Wow, that was a lot of fun. Um, Boy, it can be kind of dangerous when you get three pastors together and get us rolling, but hopefully uh, you enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, I really appreciate my colleagues so much, and they offer so much to our our church. uh, Yeah, it's just a lot of fun being with them. We may want to do it again next week. Who knows? Um, We look forward to doing life with you next week. Um, We know it's been a challenging week for some, for our nation, uh, which is uh, very divided. Our election showed us that. No matter if you're happy with the outcome or or disappointed in the outcome, I want you to know that God is very much with you. Uh, God is not forsaking you. God loves you through and through. And that's what I love about our community of faith is we're with each other during the hard times, during the good times. And uh, we are a family. I hope you can find uh, some respite with us. And always feel that generous welcome, uh, no matter what walk of life you come from. Uh, You can find that here in our church family at First Lutheran Church. Look forward to talking with you next week. Until then, I hope you have a great week. And uh, may you feel God's presence in real and tangible ways. May you feel Christ's forgiveness for you uh, 100%. And God walking with you every day this week as you put your faith first. 